Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Asir. I'm with Energy Gigs, uh, and we're joined uh, with uh, Catherine Colbert, the founder and CEO of K&K &K Process. Um, we're going to start in maybe one or two minutes, but before we do that, I just want to quick, you know, quickly um, talk about Energy Gigs real quick and then um, turn it over to Catherine, who is our, our, our guest. Um, she's um, an expert in process safety. Um, you know, and, and I was also running for railroad commissioner here in, in Texas. So she's got a lot of really interesting insights around process safety and safety more broadly. Um, it's January, so it's a good time to talk about safety as you think about your operations for the rest of 2024. Um, for those that are new to Energy Gigs, uh, we are a, a, a talent platform. And, um, you know, we basically connect energy professionals and energy experts uh, to energy companies that look to hire them, either through consulting engagements, full-time job opportunities, or uh, temp to perm uh, placement. Uh, we have a, a platform, uh, uh, like almost like an Upwork, but for the energy industry, but we also provide um, offline services to companies that are looking for that sort of support. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you guys again to Catherine Colbert. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us uh, uh, on our very first webinar of 2024. Um, you, I mean, you have tons of uh, safety experience and um, you have a specific focus in on around process safety. Um, if you don't mind telling us a little bit about yourself, and I know you have a little bit of, of a presentation you want to kind of start us, start us with. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. And, you know, thank you for having me. I'm excited to, you know, start this year with, with safety and January is a great time to talk about safety. And so is every other month. Um, it's always yeah. important to, to make sure that that's, that's at the beginning of everything. Um, so I just want to quickly start with, um, you know, most meetings start with a safety moment. Uh, as you mentioned, I am a process safety expert, so slightly different, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I wanted to start with a process safety moment uh, before we get into the, the weeds here. Um, so one thing to think about is your process safety information. So all of those things like drawings and design um, details and calculations and all that sort of good stuff that kind of goes into your, your facility. Um, think about where that's kept. Uh, is it accessible by everyone that needs to, to see it um, when they need to see it? And is it also safe from hazards such as like flooding or fires? Um, you know, sometimes people will keep hard copies, which can be okay, but then, you know, you need to think about, wait, is this my only controlled copy? Um, you know, where, where are the rest of them? Or do we keep them all electronically? And then do we have a backup system for, you know, uh oh, what happens if the network goes down, but, you know, the guys in the facility still need to access uh, PNID or something like that. So just things to think about um, as you're going through your day, think about all of your information that you've got and where it's stored and how accessible and how safe it is. So that's my, my process safety moment. So uh, going on, Jason, as you uh, said, to give a little intro about me, um, I live in Houston and I am a professional engineer. My license is in New York, uh, which is where I grew up and where I started working. Um, I also have a project management professional certification from PMI, and that's not specific to engineering nor the energy industry. Um, you know, it, it's a general project management certification. I currently work for a major oil and gas company as their senior process safety engineer. And um, as you mentioned, I also uh, own and operate K&K Process. And we are a uh, pipeline and process safety consulting firm. And as you mentioned, because <laughs> that, that doesn't keep me busy enough, I'm also running for um, a seat on the Texas Railroad Commission this year. Um, there are three commissioners and one is up every two years. And for those, I'll, I'll just do a quick little plug on that. For those that aren't familiar with the Texas Railroad Commission, it has absolutely nothing to do with railroads even though its name is the Railroad Commission, um, and it's all about energy and oil and gas regulation. So um, something that I, I know a little bit about and uh, definitely am looking forward to, to campaigning this year. Um, I also like to be involved in my community. You know, a lot of people ask, oh, what do you do in your free time? You know, <laughs> not that I have a lot, but in my spare time, I like to volunteer. I like to know what's going on in my community and, and help out. Um, 
If you ran the Houston Marathon a couple weeks ago, you might have seen me out there. Uh, I've been out on the course for the last eight years as a volunteer. Um, and I also am a volunteer with the League of Women Voters. I think voting is extremely important. Um, and I've co-chaired their voter helpline at KPRC for the last few years. So you may have seen me flash across your TV um, on election day. And a little about K&K Process. Um, we were founded in 2016 and it, it, you may wonder, you know, K and K, there must be another K. <laughs> there is. Uh, there, I founded the company with a business partner, uh, but he has since left the company and I've continued on with the operation. We work with companies in all different industries, not only energy, um, but the big thing that we, we work with is companies that have highly hazardous chemicals. So it could be oil and gas, it could be petrochemicals, it could be food and beverage, it could be, um, you know, fireworks, that, that's another one that's a lot of people don't really think about. So um, most industries have an aspect of the hazardous chemicals um, that our work applies to. So we can, we can go in, in many different um, industries. So let's see, so a little about the industry. I want to share very quickly, let me get my right thing here. Um, just quickly, I wanna give a, a background on process safety. Um, the worst industrial disaster, which many of you may have heard of, uh, hopefully you have, um, it's generally accepted that Bhopal, India, which happened in 1984. And to give a little background on this, you'll see a, a picture there of kind of the, the remnants of the plant. Um, it was overnight in December in 1984, and um, a large amount of water had entered a tank that was supposed to be, um, you know, not really in service. It was kind of waiting to, to get rid of the chemical that was in it. Um, it had methyl isocyanate in it, which is also known as MIC, M-I-C. And when this water entered the tank, it caused a reaction, which they obviously were not expecting. Um, and with that reaction, the tank began to overpressure. So what happened, they did have an emergency vent on the tank, which opened, which is what it's supposed to do. However, that released um, large volumes of toxic gas to the atmosphere and the cooling and the flaring systems that were on that vessel were inoperable at the time. So the, the emergency vent was the only thing protecting that vessel. Um, and so as, as it kept releasing, there was a poisonous gas mixture that covered the entire city of Bhopal. Wow. And you may think, oh, you know, right, if we have a, a chemical release like, like in Houston, you know, it happens regularly. But Bhopal was more of a tent city at the time. Um, so people couldn't turn off their HVAC systems or they couldn't you know, go inside and shelter. They were basically in tents. So they, they had this poisonous gas that exposed more than 500,000 people um, almost instantaneously. And over 2,000 people died immediately that night. Um, over 8,000 more died within two weeks. And there are still people um, you know, who have issues that that we think are linked to the Bhopal incident that, you know, maybe we'll never know. Hmm. So, so this was really the, the beginning of PSM. Um, and so because of what happened in Bhopal and, you know, kind of looking at other industrial incidents that have happened, um, the, the general public and Congress both pushed OSHA uh, to develop what they call their process safety management rule which they developed in 1990. So remember, Bhopal was in 1984. OSHA didn't actually come out with a rule until 1990. And then they finally published it as a standard in 1992. And enforcement started in 1997. So there, there was a long time there um, where we didn't really have a, a standard or anything to, to hold industry against. Um, so now it's known as the PSM standard. And if you want to find it, it's um, in the Code of Federal Reg Register. Uh, it's 1910.119. So a lot of times you'll, 
you'll he'll hear people talk about that. Um, so it's part of the OSHA standard. And um, it really describes requirements for preventing or minimizing the consequences of catastrophic releases of toxic, reactive, flammable, explosive chemicals. Um, you know, something that could release, could result in something like Bhopal or a fire or explosion. Um, you know, a lot of people, especially here in, in Texas, know about the West Texas fertilizer plant. You know, that, that's another one that was, should have been covered under the PSM standard and, and wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. so there have been a lot of, a lot of incidents out there um, that have led to the development um, of this PSM standard. Catherine, um, just a quick question on that. Yeah. Um, so particularly with the fertilizer in, um, in, in sort of at top of mind, it, are, are there instances with new developments, new technologies, new chemical processes or, or manufacturing capabilities where they don't, they're not perceived to belong to P, the PSM safety regulation? And so, but then some, an incident happens and say, like, oh no, it should have been. Is that kind of how it's been occurring? Or, um, yeah, so, you know, the PSM standard came out, like I said, in 1992, finally, as a final rule, um, and it hasn't been updated since. So there have been, you know, new, new uses of chemicals, new chemicals um, that have been developed and, you know, as, as something happens, unfortunately, right, as there, there is an incident, like, at, like in West Texas, um, then the OSHA says, oh, <laughs> maybe we need to add a few more chemicals. So, so the PSM standard right now is currently under revision. Um, however, it takes like eight or nine years to revise these standards. <laughs> so it, it's not happening anytime quickly, um, mm. but they are looking at expanding the chemicals that are covered, um, the, the types of facilities that are covered. Um, so there will be a little more, um, you know, there, there will be some change and there will be some, some new stuff that's, that's covered there. Okay. No, thank you. Yeah. So, um, just to give you an idea of PSM, uh, we like to use the Swiss cheese model, which, um, <laughs> you know, you, you don't want all your holes in your Swiss cheese to line up. And so you have a hazard out there that you know of, um, right? And then you've got things like engineering controls, administrative controls, behavioral controls that will hopefully try to prevent an incident from happening. And if by chance all those holes line up and um, there is an incident, there's also mitigating barriers that are involved in PSM to try to minimize the consequences. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the background on PSM. Um, if you do look at the regulation, there are 14 different elements. Um, I'm not going to go through all these right now, but um, just so you can, when, when you go and look up the standard, um, you can see that there is a description of each, each of these elements and, you know, how they kind of play into the whole, the whole big picture of uh, PSM compliance. Mm -hmm. Catherine, it looks like we do have a question from one of the attendees. Um, this is a question that kind of relates to geothermal. The question is, um, how can we apply your experience with hazardous chemicals to handling of high temperature uh, geothermal brines? Um, so I guess if you're drilling in geothermal well, um, the, the brines are uh, have different gases and they do, yes, um, and they have a lot of toxic gases in them. <laughs> um, so, so it's interesting you asked that question because oil and gas drilling is one of the areas that OSHA is looking to expand into. Um, when, when the PSM standard originally came out, they excluded oil and gas drilling um, with the intent that the industry itself would kind of um, self-regulate and would be developing its own standard. And for those of us in the drilling area, we know that that hasn't really happened. So, um, so that is one area that OSHA is looking to expand into. Um, so right now, as far as you know, using the PSM tools, if you will, um, there's definitely the ability to look at, you know, if you look at these 14 elements, um, there, there are different ways that you can 
apply them to um, things like drilling and like the the brine that comes out of of um, you know wells, and you need to look at you know what is your overall system? Do you have a system in place? Do you have you know emergency planning and response? Definitely a big one um, when you're dealing with with those types of hazards. Um, you know I know in some of those brines there's benzenes and you know all sorts of different ke other chemicals too. Um, so you need to make sure that you plan that in advance. Um, employee participation is, I'm going to say that that's a really, really big one right there. Um, I know a lot of our folks out in the, the oil patch have a lot of experience and they know, you know, what's going to happen and they, they can really help you, um, you know, develop a process so that you can um, operate more safely. Uh, mechanical integrity, definitely a big one with wells, um, you know, with all the casing pressures and all that sort of thing, making sure that the, all the, the valves are operating correctly, that, you know, all the casings are, are integral there and not, you know, blown out and releasing things subsurface, that sort of stuff. So, so there are a lot of the same elements within the PSM um, that you can absolutely apply to, to things like drilling and and those wastes that come out of the, the process. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Um, can you uh, talk us through uh, how to overcome challenges of translating process safety management into operational practice or execution? Um, um, yeah, so one thing, um, you know, process safety, if, if you look at these 14 elements, you can see that they kind of touch on a lot of different things, right? It's not just one aspect of a process. Um, you know, we deal with training, we deal with um, pre-startup hazard re and safety reviews, um, operating procedures, all that stuff. So as far as pulling, you know, this into operations, um, it's really a, it needs to be a, a synergy of, hey, you know, we need somebody from the top probably saying, we're going to do this so that there's support. Um, but then, uh, like, as, as a process safety engineer, I work with our operations department on a daily basis of, hey, what's going on here? You know, we had a, an incident, or not even an incident, we had a for instance, something shut down, right? Uh, we had a, a high pressure something on one tank and it shut something down. Okay, let's look at that and see what happened. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of comparison between process safety and occupational safety. And I know a lot of people in occupational safety have heard of Heinrich's triangle where, you know, a lot of the, the little things like the slips and the trips and the falls and the, you know, dropping things, but not hitting anybody and all that, those all add up eventually to something big happening, right? And someone getting really hurt or, or possibly a fatality. And it's the same with PSM. So if you have a lot of um, like little spills, mm -hmm. things like that, um, you know, th those can be indicative of something bigger is going to happen. And, you know, if you have a lot of those little things happening, what maybe we're going to have a big spill and maybe it's going to lead to, I mean, I, I don't want to say it, but, you know, it, it could lead to something like a Macondo, right? The, that That's our, our big top of our triangle that we don't want to happen. So if we can start looking at all of those little things that are happening and really, you know, from a, a process safety standpoint, work with operations to, to investigate those and, hey, let's fix it, right? Um, you know, oh, there, there's been a lot of corrosion under insulation at this one plant, you know. Well, let's, let's look at that, let's figure it out, and let's fix the root cause of that, rather than just, oh, we need to, you know, change this little section of pipe and put new insulation on. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, <laughs> so it's going to happen again. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so process safety really needs to work hand in hand with the operations department to, um, you know, help them see things. Cause a lot of times, 
you know, I mean, I work with a lot of guys who have been doing this a whole long time, right? Like they've been out in the field for, they've been out on a rig for, you know, 40 some odd years. And what do I know coming out there to tell them this and that? And, you know, but it, it really, you need to be able to work with them and talk with them and help them see that, hey, maybe this leak you're having is going to lead to something bigger. Let, let's fix the whole, the root cause of it now so that we know that you're going home at the end of your, sh your hitch. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've heard, I remember when I worked in uh, well containment, there was, there was always an emphasis by the leadership of the company to, uh, to try to cultivate a culture of safety. Cause um, I mean, can you talk a little bit about like what, what is, what, how it does culture play into um, the elements? I mean, is that part of the 14 elements or is that sort of the glue that binds it like all like. Yeah. So culture is, is kind of the, I don't know if you want to call it the <laughs> the umbrella that sees it, you know, is over everything, or if it's the floor that's holding everything up. Mm. Um, but again, it goes back to, hey, we had a you know a pinhole leak on this pipe. Um, what are we doing to to fix the root cause, or is it, oh well, just fix it and move on with life, right? And and so th those are two very different cultures. It's a, hey, let's just you know, band-aid everything and we just need to keep running or it's a, hey, we really need to look at this and make sure that we're, we're operating safely. And mm -hmm. again, it comes, it comes from the top, right. Of, mm -hmm. you know, are, are we going to stop production for, you know, an hour so that we can investigate this or are we going to just keep pushing through and pushing through and pushing through and cross our fingers and hope that something bad doesn't happen? Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Very, very, very cool. I, um, I know, um, you know, like our, the community that we serve and the members and the users of our, of our platform, they, you know, it's a two-sided marketplace in some ways, right? We, we have the companies that hire uh, consultants and then the consultants are the experts themselves. And, um, you know, we have a lot of people coming into, coming into the energy industry, you know, and I'd love to understand, like, how, what got you into the into process safety? Like, what was it that drew you into it? And um... yeah, so um, I was working as a um, for a consulting firm in my first engineering job, and they were looking to diversify a little, and they got a contract with um, you know one of the local plants and needed somebody to to go and do. Um, relief valve calculations <laughs> and I was low man on the totem pole. So they sent me. <laughs> and, you know, that, that was really my first introduction to process safety. Um, but I really fell in love with it. Like it's really a proactive approach to, to industry and to, to life really. Right. Like, I mean, it, it's horrible. I can't go anywhere without, you know, is that really a safe thing that we're doing or should, should those kids be climbing on that? Or, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's a lot of thinking ahead um, and being proactive and trying to prevent incidents before they happen. Um, so it, it's become kind of, you know, <laughs> central to my life, I guess, um, you know, rather than reacting to things, I like to be proactive and think about things um, beforehand. So, yeah, I think uh, definitely having an engineering background helps um, tremendously. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, I have to deal with a whole lot of people across the company. Um, so it helps that I can talk the engineers talk. I can, you know, I work with operations. I can talk their talk. I can, you know, sometimes I have to deal with legal. Mm. Uh, you know, this, this is a, a regulatory requirement. So you need to be able to, to talk their talk too, right? Um, you know, and, and <laughs> talking with operations versus talking with the legal department are very different conversations that you're having. I, I can only imagine like uh, use of different words, I think is like, uh, to put it nicely, I guess, probably. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I, in terms of like, if, 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 if I'm in college now, or if I'm in a community college, or I'm just graduating high school, like, and I wanted to, I'm intrigued by uh, safety and process safety, like, what, what would you recommend our education paths for, for me? Um, yeah, so really any engineering is a great educational path. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll shout that from the rooftops that engineering has not led me wrong, um, mm -hmm. as much as I 
want to yell at my mother for making me go into engineering, <laughs> but I, I think it's definitely served me well. Um, as far as process safety, there's also through um, AICHE, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, they have a um, Center for Chemical Process Safety. Um, so you can go to their website and, and look that up. And they have all sorts of classes, um, trainings, and you know, hands-on type stuff um, that you can, they have boot camps, they've got you know, how to develop a program, they've got um, all sorts of things. So that's a great place to, to start. Um, and then just just kind of industry in general, right? If you're interested in, you know, like I'm, I'm sure a lot of the, the folks here are, are energy folks. And if you're interested in that, then get involved in another networking, you know, an energy networking um, group, you know, things like, like I said, the AICHE, they've got a global Congress on process safety happening in New Orleans in March. Um, there are other things like the American Petroleum Institute or Texas Chemical Council. There's there's things all over. Um, and a lot of safety conferences, right? If you look for um, any sort of safety type conference, they a lot of them will have a process safety component. Um, you know, one of the tracks on the conference, that sort of thing. So you can always kind of go to one of those and see like, hey, is this something that, that I'm interested in? Okay, no, that's great. Um, and um, with the field sort of continuously evolving, like how have you sort of kept, you know, kept your your saw sharp, so to speak, you know, in, in terms of wh where the industry is going? Um, yeah, it's really, I think a, a big one is that that Center for Chemical Process Safety. Um, they they definitely communicate quite well, attending conferences. Um, and you can also set up um, notifications from the Code of Federal, uh, the Federal Register that anytime OSHA makes an update regarding PSM, you'll get an email, oh, cool. um, which, is, which is definitely a helpful thing. So you kind of know what um, the regulators are doing and what they're dealing with. Um, so you can be aware of that because they have to publish everything and then give you know a 60 day comment period and, and, and that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of time to kind of do your research as to what's happening. Um, and then another good source is the Chemical Safety Board. Hmm. Um, they, they're headquartered in DC and they do a lot of the incident investigations and they do amazing reports um, and videos and all sorts of um, great things to really show what happened and why they're recommending um, changes, whether it's to the, the PSM standard, whether it's to industry, whether it's just to um, a, a specific um, facility or manufacturer, so. Okay, no, that's great. We, we actually just got another question from uh, an attendee. Um, this is sort of related to the energy transition or new energies. Um, have you seen an increase in PSM conversations as it relates to the development of the hydrogen economy? Um, yeah, so hydrogen is a covered chemical, <laughs> so it is uh, covered under the PSM um, umbrella. Uh, I, I haven't been that involved in the hydrogen space, so I haven't, um, you know, really seen a lot of that, but I'm sure it's happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the, again, going to those hydrogen conferences, which is not something that I have been attending, but I'm sure that they have... Um, you know, information on process safety and it, and like I said, it is covered. So they're, they're going to have to be aware of, of this regulation and what's, what's going on with it. We, um, last year we went to a number of conferences, uh, where, where hydrogen was sort of the darling of the ball in many, in many of these, um, conferences. And, but the one thing we didn't hear a lot of conversations or see any innovation around is like the, the safety around hydrogen or the risks associated with moving hydrogen, you know, or, you know, related chemicals like ammonia or other, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? And where, where is that going? Like, um, so it, that kind of goes on the pipeline side of things, I would say. Um, and FIMSA, which is under the DOT regulates pipelines. Um, although here in Texas, if it's intrastate, it's uh, regulated by the Railroad Commission, which is, oh, <laughs> yeah. so, um, 
Yeah, so we really need, uh, pipelines can be a very safe way to transport materials. Uh, yeah. However, they also have evidence of leaking and they, you know, have catastrophic spills and such. So they they really need to be regulated well and made sure the make sure that they're being taken care of. And um, you know, I, I, no company wants to do bad. No company wants yeah. to have you know a, a major spill. Unfortunately, however, they happen. So um, we just need to make sure that um, those regulations are staying up to date. Um, and and it's tough when you know, like the PSM standard, it's taking eight years to update the standard, right? So, and it's the same thing with, with the FIMSA pipeline safety standards, right? Like the, that right now is still, um, it's not mandatory. Mm. So, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff out there that can be done and, you know, it, it just, we need to make sure that we're doing that and that we're you know, following those regulations and that we're, again, being proactive. Um, that, that's the big part of it is don't wait for an incident to happen to say, oh, maybe I should have, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you need to think about that beforehand um, so that we can prevent those from happening in the first place. Yeah, makes sense. Well, I, I think, um, Catherine, we're, we're at time. I, um, I, you know, I, it always goes by so quickly, the, these webinars. Um, <laughs> I really do want to thank you for for sharing your insights about process safety, talking about your background, and you know helping us understand a little bit more about process safety. I mean, thinking about the next year, obviously you have a, you have a lot of things going on this year. But like, what are you looking like in terms of the industry? Like, what, what final thoughts on process safety in twenty twenty four? Like, what are you, what are you seeing, or what are you expecting, or hoping for? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was kind of hoping that OSHA would come out with their new regulation, but uh, I was just on a webinar with, with someone from OSHA last week, and I don't think it's happening. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think just more awareness of it and more, more companies that really are looking to do good um, to really follow this this. PSM standard, not just, you know, the minimum, but hey, let's, let's do even better than the minimum so that we can, we can really show that we are a, a good industry and mm -hmm. that we're here to, to help protect people while still, you know, being a viable economic driver. Gotcha. Well, I, you know, we may have some uh, companies that are be interested in talking to you. So we're gonna we're gonna send the, the show notes, if you will, uh, after after this. Um, we'll include your contact information if you want or not. You know, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, no. Please do. Please okay. do. Okay. Um, well, thank you again, Catherine, so much for sharing your time. Thank you to all of our attendees. Um, we're going to um, this this call has been recorded, and so we're gonna post it on our on our YouTube channel, um, and then we'll send an after action sort of notes um, about um, about the, the topics that we discussed, and as well as the contact information for Catherine if you wanted to reach out to her directly. Um, Thank you again, everyone, and we'll look forward to seeing you guys next month at our next webinar.